All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we start into this next topic, we just pray again for your guidance, for your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds to receive your truth. And especially as we consider this important topic of relationship and the method of education you've given us in Deuteronomy, we pray you help us to be able to apply it and follow in our families. And I pray you'll speak through me and be clarity of mind and the right words. In the name of Jesus, amen. We're going to turn our attention now to the topic of relationship. A vitally important element of true education. And we find it exemplified in the book of Deuteronomy, as well as sustained by science. Although this presentation is more uh, along the lines uh, of biblical and, and spiritual research, uh, although we are going to see some science. You can turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them, to an interesting story that we find in the book of Judges. The book of Judges, chapter 2. Judges chapter 2, and we'll read verse 7 through 10. Chapter 2, 7 through 10. Now we know the story. The children of Israel had entered the promised land, Jothro being their leader right after Moses. The Bible says, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And verse 10 says, they buried him in the border of his, sorry, that was verse 9. Verse 10 says, and all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works he had done in Israel. Interesting. So Joshua was a great leader of Israel. And they entered the promised land. That generation that lived under Joshua's leadership was faithful to God. But then another generation died, and the Bible says this next generation knew not the Lord, nor the works which he had done for Israel. There's some interesting characteristics about that generation which had entered the promised land. This is one of the most spiritually strong generations in the history of Israel. They uh, so do the land of Canaan. They, we all know the story of Jericho, right? <laughs> this was the generation. They had marched around Jericho. And uh, it was a very spiritually strong generation. But then we find the very next generation failed to stay close to the Lord. Why? What happened? And why so fast? We find this actually was a matter of education and a failure in education. And I think it's important for us to study these things because they were written for us. We go in our Bibles, you don't have to go there, I'll have it here on the screen. First Corinthians 10, verse 11. Uh, th that chapter in Corinthians talks about the history of Israel. And then it says, these things were written unto us, upon whom the ends of the world are come. These were given us as examples. We can learn from these things. What could we learn? Let's talk about a few things, a few questions. First of all, what would God purpose for the nation of Israel? What was it? What was that? To be an example. To be an example. Yeah. To be, we say, to be a light. God wanted them to be a light to the nations around them. Unfortunately, they didn't do that, right? They kept the light to themselves. So God's desire was then for them to be an example and a light. Does God want us to be the same as Christians today? Absolutely. So God's purpose for the nation of Israel was to be a light. Now, to accomplish this, God did a few things. He called them out of Egypt, first of all. Did Egypt represent? Do we know? The world, yes, but more specifically, sin, yes, and more specifically, what were they in Egypt? Bond. Slaves, okay? So it's slavery to sin. Has God called us out that I will liberate you from sin? Yeah, absolutely. So he's called us out of slavery to sin. Um, 
he, he asked the children of Israel to be separate, both physically and spiritually, so that they could be a light. Because a light is not a light if it's like the darkness around it. <laughs> so he set them apart so that they could be that city set on a hill that Jesus talked about. Now, the question, next question to ask would be, okay, what was God's method to maintain their position of being a light to the world? How did he design that they would keep this light burning? The answer to that we find in Deuteronomy, several places, it was faithfulness to God's word. Let's just look at a couple of examples. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them so in the land whither you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. How are they to maintain their position of, of leadership in the world? It was being faithful to God's word. Is, that any, is it any different today? God wants us to be faithful to his word, right? And that makes us light to those around us. And there are many other examples. For those of you taking notes, Deuteronomy 5.33, Deuteronomy 11, 22-23, Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. All of those talk about the importance of faithfulness to the word of God. Now, so God's method of making, of making them a light initially was to separate them, call them out of bondage to Egypt, but then to keep that light burning, they needed to stay faithful to his word. Now the next question is, what was God's method for maintaining this faithfulness to his word? Here's the key. One thing to call them out and make them separate. It's one thing to say, stay faithful to my word. It's quite another to keep that going, isn't it? That's what we find in the book of Judges, in the story we just read, that second generation didn't stay faithful to the word of God. The key here was God's plan of true education. Now, to properly understand this, we need to do a little history lesson. Education, page 20, that book I've been quoting from. I hope all of you have a copy by now. The system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for man throughout all after time. A model for what? All after time. Does this apply to us? I think it must. Now, what was in this model that we find in the beginning that God created in the Garden of Eden? You know, any good educational program has at least four components. You need uh, some textbooks, something to study at least. You need a classroom, you need a teacher, and you need students, right? <laughs> did we have this in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden? Yeah. Absolutely we did. The Garden of Eden was the schoolroom. Nature was the lesson book. The creator himself was the instructor, and the parents of the human family were the students. What a great school. Who wants to go to that school? <laughs> I do, that's for sure. Now, what was the unit of organization that we find in the Garden of Eden? Keyword, family. The system of education established in Eden centered in the family. Adam was the son of God. We read Luke 3.38. And it was from their father that the children of the highest received instruction. Theirs, in the truest sense, was a family school. Now, back up one slide here. It says that the creator himself was the instructor. If you are listening to God talking to you, what are you hearing? What are you hearing if God is talking to you? God's voice, okay. And he's using words. So you're hearing God's word, all right? We, sometimes when we talk about God's word, we think of it as the written word of God, the Bible. But this is just the written word. <laughs> if God's talking to you, you're still hearing God's word. 
And so in the, at the very beginning, we see the lesson book was nature, but God himself was the teacher. In other words, the content of this plan of education that God established at the beginning was his word and your nature, his works. So we can say that the plan of be, in, at the beginning of true education in Eden was that the content was the word and the works of God, nature and God himself speaking. The unit of organization was the family, and the teacher was God himself. What a school. But then something happened. We know this as the fall. Sin entered the world. And what happened to this plan of education? That's the most important thing for us to understand because we live after sin entered the world. So what happened? Let's continue. In the divine plan of education, as adapted to man's condition after the fall, Christ stands as the representative of the Father, the connecting link between God and man. He is the great teacher of mankind, and he ordained that men and women should be his representative. The family of the school and the parents were the teachers. Interesting. So sin entered the world, and it destroyed a few things. So now let's analyze what changed. We saw the content of true education at the beginning was the word and the works of God. After sin entered the world, did the word and works of God stay as part of true education? Absolutely. God didn't throw out his word. God didn't throw out nature. Some things changed, right? But he didn't throw it out. Did, um, did the family, did God throw out the family as the unit of organization? Or do we still have families today? Still have families. That didn't change. So what changed? The teacher. The teacher changed. No longer could God directly instruct the human family because sin had brought this disconnect. Amen. And so he established a system of representatives. What do we see here? Jesus Christ stands as representative of the Father. He's the connecting link between God and man. He's the teacher of mankind. And he ordained that who? Men and women should be his or Jesus representatives. You see what's going on here? God threw Jesus to the parents, and then the parents are the teachers of the children. What we see happen, it's interesting, after sin entered this world, is a new level of parental responsibility that didn't exist before. And we'll see some reasons for that in a minute. So the content remained the word and works of God. The unit of organization remained the family, but now we have Jesus teaching through the parents. That's God's plan now after sin had entered the world. Now let's continue in history a little bit. The education centering in the family was that which prevailed in the days of the patriarchs. For the schools thus established, God provided the conditions most favorable for the development of character. Days of the patriarchs, who are we talking about? Samuel, even earlier than that? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, okay, those stories. And it was an education centering in the family. And it says God provided here the conditions most favorable for the development of character. Has anyone found that to be true? We were just talking about that last night, weren't we? You never learn so much about yourself till you live in a family, especially married with kids, right? God designed family as a means of perfecting our characters. Do we see Satan trying to break that today? Mm -hmm. Trying to get us to live independent, self-centered lives today. Yeah. This was God's plan of education. Now, what were, these, what were they learning? The people who were under his direction still pursued the plan of life he had appointed at the beginning. Those who departed from God built for themselves cities, but the men who held the path, God's principles of life, dwelt among the fields and hills. There's a whole other sermon right there, I think. <laughs> we talked a little bit about country living. They were, they were tillers of the soil and keepers of flocks and herds. And in this free and independent life, with its opportunities for labor and study and meditation, they learned of God and taught their children of his words and ways. So what was the unit of organization here? Still the family, right? What were they learning? What were they teaching? What's it say right at the end there? God's works and his ways. 
Again, we get back to his works, his word. Now, how does it apply to the nation of Israel? How does it apply to the story of Judges that we were just reading about, about that second generation that didn't know the word of the Lord? The very next paragraph says, this was, in other words, that plan we just studied about, this was the method of education that God desired to establish in Israel. When God called the children of Israel out of Egypt, he said, I want to establish this plan of education because it's the ideal. But there was a problem. But when brought out of Egypt, there were among the Israelites few prepared to be workers together with him in the training of their children. The parents themselves needed instruction and discipline. Who needed the teaching? The parents were the ones who needed education. So many times we talk about true education as something that we do to the children. So many times I get the question, hey, what's the curriculum for true education? Now you're kind of missing the point. <laughs> Not saying you can't have helpful materials. But with the nation of Israel, with the people called out of slavery to sin, as we have been, true education started with the parents. Yeah. And this is key. If we want our children to receive a correct education, we ourselves need to receive a correct education first. Otherwise, we're going to give them the same false education that we've received. We'll follow the same wrong methods, that we will have the same wrong ideas, the same wrong goals, if we ourselves aren't changed first. This is key. And it's important to realize God did not say, okay, you can read it, read the study, the, the story in your Bible. God did not say, okay, let's just start a new system of education. School has been come along for hundreds of years. God said, my plan of the family is ideal. I want to maintain this unit. So we need to educate the family. We need to educate the parents to follow their job properly. Well, then we come to the book of Deuteronomy. The wilderness wanderings are over. You see Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, those whole wilderness wanderings, the tabernacle in the wilderness, God giving them his law. All these things were designed to educate the parents to help them do their job better. But then we come to Deuteronomy, and everything from the previous years is repeated in the book of Deuteronomy with the addition of something. Who knows what it is? Teach your children. Exactly. It was mentioned a few times in Exodus and other places, but Deuteronomy emphasizes it. These things that you've been learning, you need to teach them to your children if you want to stay successful in the land of Canaan. Here's the verse. I'm sure many of us know it very well. And these words, which I command thee that they shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest. Uh, this is not an isolated verse in the book of Deuteronomy. It's repeated many times uh, in different words throughout the book. Do we consider what this means, though? Let's analyze this verse. It says, and these words. What words are we talking about? What words? Whose words may I have said? God's words, okay? God's words. These words, which I command thee this day, God is speaking through Moses here, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. Okay, who is he speaking to? Parents. Whose heart do the words need to be in? Parents, okay? God's saying, your words, my words need to be in your heart. And then, Thou shalt teach them how diligently unto thy children. When? When you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You notice what's happened, what God is describing here. This, this is not casually chosen words. When you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. In other words, it doesn't matter the location. In the house, 
Outside the house, you're to teach the children. When you lie down and when you rise up, what's this talking about? Bookends of the day. All day, wherever you are, teach your children is what he's saying. But notice, what's the first step? These words shall be in thine heart. There's two steps in the Deuteronomy method. First, example. Second, relationship. First, example. Second, relationship. It says, these words shall be in thine heart. What does it mean for something to be in your heart? We're getting hungry, aren't we? What does it mean for something to be in your heart? Okay. What was that? What's up? You love it. Does it change you? Do you talk about it? Do you want to tell other people about it? You live it. It changes who you are, right? What is God saying here in Deuteronomy? Parents, if you want to teach your children, my word needs to become who you are. You need to be converted into the example of who I am and represent that to your children. It means a change. I love this. Later on in the book, Education says, not as a dry theory were these things to be taught. How many times do we teach this stuff like a dry theory? Just read it and go on with life. That's not the way it is to be taught. Those who would impart truth must themselves practice its principles only by reflecting the character of God and the uprightness, nobility, and unselfishness of their own lives can they impress others. Example. As a preparation for teaching his precepts, God commands that they be hidden in the hearts of the parents. In order to interest our children in the Bible, parents, do you want your children interested in the Bible? Yes or no? What must you do? We ourselves must be interested in it. To awaken in them a love for its study, do you want them to love the study of the Bible? We must love it. Our instruction to them will have only the weight of influence given it by our own example and spirit. If you want your children to love the word of God, you've got to live it. You need to ask for a heart transformed by the power of God so that you can exemplify the change that you want to see in your children. There must be transformation. I put this picture up there intentionally. Think about the transformation involved here. How much transformation is there to go from a caterpillar to a butterfly? Complete, totally new individual. It must be that in the life of the parents, there's a total and complete transformation to exemplify God to their children. Otherwise, children grow up. We've seen it. I know. Children grow up. They leave the things that their parents have taught them because they think, if those things have made my parents so ugly, then I don't want to be part of that. We've seen it, right? But, does it stop with an example? No, indeed. Because there's educational methodology, there's parenting philosophies out there that say, just set the right example, that's all you can do. Have we heard this? Set the right example, I mean, that's, you can't do anything more than that. Did God stop with setting the example in Deuteronomy? Is the example important? It's the number one most important step. The first step. You can't stop an example. You next have to teach, but there's a method for teaching. Diligently, it says. What does it say? In your house, outside your house, sitting, walking, lying down, rising up. You be the example, and then all day, every day, as you spend that time together, 
you're investing in relationship. And as you're building a relationship, you're opening the heart to receive the instruction. And this is key. This isn't a class. This isn't a once a week thing. This is all day, every day, opening the heart to receive the word of God. Without relationship, so without the proper example, children grow up to say, well, if those things made my parents so awful, I don't want to be part of that. But without relationship, children grow up and leave the things their parent taught them because their heart was never open to receive the truth. Now, let's go back to what we just read. In the divine plan of education, adapted man's condition after the fall, Christ is the representative of the Father. He has established a system of representatives. The families, the school, the parents were the teachers. It was no longer possible for God to speak faith to faith with humans. And so God arranged the system of representatives. Originally in that garden classroom, God walked and talked with the parents, right? Now he says, well, the garden classroom is still there, but parents, you're going to have to walk and talk in my place. Adam and Eve studied the book of nature with God instructing them personally. Now, who does the instruction? Parents, right? Originally, God communicated directly as a father to his human children. Now he has a system of representatives so the beautiful family unit can be preserved. He says, I can't be with you personally. You'll have to do it, parents, in my place. Some of you might think I'm getting a little off track, though. I mean, that's a strong statement, right? To be like, parents are representing God to their children. Parents are in the place of God to their children. That's a strong statement, right? Yeah, those aren't my words. God himself, who has placed upon them a responsibility for the souls committed to their charge, has ordained that during the earlier years of life, parents shall stand in the place of God to their children. That's God's design in Deuteronomy. So parents, you need to represent me to your children. Let me say that in some more acceptable wording, though. Perhaps this is a little strong. Let's just say this. Parents are to represent the character of God to their children. Amen? We all agree with that. Parents need to represent the character of God to their children. Okay, good. Let me ask you, what is the character of God? It is a God who is focused on relationship with his children. It is the character of a God who wants to be with his children. It is the character of a God who loves his children so much that he set aside his dignity. He set aside his reserve. He set aside his power. He set aside his wealth and positions. Position, possessions. He set aside everything that he owned to come to earth and become one of us to demonstrate who God was. If parents are to represent the character of God to their children, they need to represent the character of a God who is willing to make any sacrifice to be with your children. Amen. Do I need to repeat that? If parents are to represent the character of God to their children, they need to represent the character of God correctly. And that is a God who is willing to make any sacrifice to be with his children. A lot of responsibility. God wanted so much to have relationship with us that Jesus came in his own life gave an illustration of who God is. He became one of us so that we could experience a relationship with the Lord. I mean, that's just incredible. I think of this. 
Parents, some parents do not understand their children and are not really acquainted with them. Do we see this today? Parents just have no clue. There's often a great distance between parents and children. If the parents would enter more fully into the feelings of their children and draw out what is in their heart, they would have a better influence on them. Now let's think about this. I mentioned the life of Jesus. Jesus came to demonstrate who God was. How did Jesus demonstrate parenting? Ever think about that? Jesus wasn't a parent. Did he demonstrate parenting principles? Let's think about this. Jesus sacrificed everything to be with us. Do parents need to be willing to demonstrate that to their children? Right. Willing to sacrifice anything so they can be with them and invest in that relationship with their children? Jesus set aside his royalty to be a man among men. Parents, perhaps being willing to set aside your dignity and reserve to be a child among your children. Play with them, work with them, run with them. Jesus formed a family with his disciples, always kept them with him. Read about the disciples. They're walking, they're talking, they're eating together, living life together. Parents, can you do the same? Keeping the clothes with them. Jesus, this one is important. Jesus came down to our level to bring us up to his. Parents need to meet their children at their level so they can bring them up higher. Jesus said, I'm with you always. I'll never forsake you. Parents should be willing to be with their children always, helping them through their hardships. Jesus discerned infinite possibilities in every human being. He awakened hope through trust. By the help of the Lord, parents can see the infinite possibilities in their children. Awaken hope through trust. Do you see why we need to study more of the character of Jesus and be transformed so that we can represent that to the children? Now, I know the question that could be coming up in some minds. Okay, I get it. Jesus is the connecting link between God and man. But why not Jesus direct to the children? You can think about that. Why did he have to insert failing, faulty, sinful human parents into this mix? About that like wouldn't it just been easier if everybody just had the same parent jesus himself i kind of thought about that too okay why is the system of representative give parents this great responsibility well the answer is quite simple yes <laughs> same reason same reason absolutely you know, we know from scientific research and brain development that young children struggle to understand things that are concrete. Any teacher will, will, will uh, appreciate this. You don't start off teaching algebra, right? You don't teach algebra to a four-year-old. You start off with some blocks of wood and give them two plus two. You've got to give them something concrete so that they can understand the abstract. The abstract kind of grows out of the concrete. Let me say it this way. Children need to experience something to understand it. That's just a basic fact of brain development. Children need to experience something to understand it. So what has God done here? We're built for relationship. God wants to have a individual relationship with every one of us. But that's a little abstract initially, right? It's not somebody there we can actually see. So God says, okay, parents, allow your children to experience a relationship by spending time with you. And as they experience this relationship in real life, something tangible, someone they can hold the hand and talk to, they get to know what it's like to have relationship and the relationship with God will grow out of that. Am I making sense?
I mean, don't misunderstand me, of course. Jesus can communicate to children. The Bible speaks of this. But we're talking in the first few years of their life. God has designed that parents have this connection with their children to teach them through experience what relationship is all about. So many spiritual lessons taught through this. I was thinking about the lesson of dependence. The Lord wants to teach us to depend on Him, doesn't He? No, not here in front of that. Does the Lord want to teach us to depend on Him? <laughs> okay, that's the essential lesson of Christianity, right? <laughs> How do children learn this? Will they learn through depending on their parents? The world pushes us to get our toddlers to be so independent that they don't need to depend on anyone. God created babies and toddlers to have to depend on their parents so they can learn to depend on the Lord. Let me just share a few points on the benefits of relationship from the science. Relationship aids in the development of conscience. Isn't that incredible? We want our children to have a good conscience. Here's from the Journal of uh, Child Development. Yes, Journal of Child Development, article called Mother Child Discourse. Especially important in the development of early conscience are a child's early relationships within the family. Relationship actually improves the resistance to temptation. You want your children to be able to resist temptation. Have a good relationship with them. Incredible. Secure children showed more engagement during the resistance to temptation's task. I mean, that's amazing. The children who were more emotionally secure had better relationships and were more able to resist temptation. Question, does our relationship with the Lord help us resist temptation? Absolutely. It's the same thing. It strengthens the impact of moral discussion. Now, this should grab the attention of every parent here. The quality of the parent-child relationship is an important moderator of the impact of parent-child discourse involving moral themes. Now, that's a complicated bit of wording there, but what it's really saying is that the quality of the relationship that a parent has with their child indicates the effect of their instruction, especially involving moral themes. Parents, do you feel like your children don't listen to you? Come on, no parents ever felt like that? <laughs> Perhaps you should focus less on words and more on time with them. Oops. It improves emotional health. Relationships very clearly has been found to improve emotional health. Do we have problems with emotional health today in the world? Huge problems, right? It builds a foundation for the relationship with God. And this is absolutely key. The reality is that the core understanding of relationship that an adult has was laid in the first three years of their life in their relationship with their parents. Famous um, research that was done by it was Dr. Elliot Barker, who studied criminal sociopaths and psychopaths individuals who committed violent crimes. And one of the characteristics of these individuals is that they have no conscience. They can commit a violent crime and they don't feel bad about it. And he studied these individuals and he found that a large percent of them, I don't remember, I, if I remember right, it was over 90% of them, had some kind of emotional disturbance in the first three years of their life. Divorce, neglect, abuse, something like that disturbed in the first three years of their life, and it affected their conscience and their ability to relate to others for the rest of their life. That relationship that a child experiences within the home, within or with their parents, forms a starting point for their relationship with the Lord. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying it's not in, that it's impossible to develop a relationship with the Lord if you haven't had that early on. Thankfully, Praise the Lord. There's a lot of paths. But we want to make it as easy as possible for our children to develop that relationship with the Lord, right? Let's just say that. We want to make it as easy as possible to give them that starting point in a relationship with you, the parent. 
The quality of attachment between infants and their mothers has significant consequences for relationship at later stages of life. But now this morning, we've been looking at the second generation and their failure to educate the next, failure of the first generation to educate the next generation. What part of the instruction in Deuteronomy did they fail to obey? We saw there was example and there was relationship. I think they really failed in both, but it was especially the relationship aspects. Because we read in Judges 2 7 that the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. This was, again, I mentioned earlier, the strongest generation that was in Israel's history. They marched around the promised land. I mean, they, they marched around Jericho. They conquered the promised land. The sun stood still. We all remember that story from the Bible, right? The sun stood still for them. They conquered their enemies, at least the ones they tried to subdue. What was unique about them? Well, they listened to the reading of the law. The Bible says they served the Lord. But what happened next? There arose another generation which did not know the Lord, nor yet the works he had done for Israel. And that's interesting. We read in Patriarchs and Prophets that God had commanded the Hebrews to teach their children his requirements, to make them acquainted with his dealings with their fathers. This was one of the special duties of every parent, one that was not to be delegated to another. In the place of stranger lips, the loving hearts of fathers and mothers were to give instruction to their children. Thoughts of God were associated, were to be associated with all the events of daily life. The mighty works of God and the deliverance of his people and the promises of the Redeemer to come were to be often recounted in the homes of Israel, and the use of figures and symbols called the lesson was given to be more firmly fixed in the memory. Notice the mighty works of God. But what did we just read in Judges chapter 2, verse 10? It said that they did not know the works which he had done for Israel. So what happened? They didn't teach it. They didn't pass it on to the next generation. They had listened to the reading of the law, but they didn't teach that law to their children. They were the Deuteronomy generation, but they missed the point of Deuteronomy to teach their children. But as I thought about this, I realized it likely wasn't information that was missing. This was the children of Israel, after all. They were surrounded with information about God. It was built into their lifestyle, their economy. You had the sanctuary services. You had the, the feast day. You had the, the, I mean, on down the list. What was missing? The proper method of instruction it wasn't the information that was missing. It was how to convey that information. Notice what we read. What was the method? Teach through relationship. All day, every day. As they spent time together, they were to cultivate an open heart to receive what they wanted to teach their children. And I imagine that many times the instruction was given in an informational way or simply through attendance at the sanctuary services or the national peace. But parents in their busyness neglected to give the instruction while they're sitting, while they're lying, while they're walking in the everyday life, neglected to focus on relationship with their children, spending time with them, working to open the heart to the word of truth. Is it any different today? How many times? Well, we have Bible class. God didn't give the children of Israel instruction to have Bible class once a week. Pastor, my child's old enough. Can you give him some studies? Did you read your Bible today, son? Well, at least he's going to church. 
I'm not saying those are bad things, but I'm saying that's not enough. That's not true education, because true information is not true education is not about information alone. True education is about relationship, transformation. And true education takes time. All the time, actually. Investment in relationship all day, every day, walking, talking, working, binding the hearts of the children to the parents, opening the heart to receive the truth. Now, I know there's a few teachers here. They're like, wow, I can't spend all the time with my students. That's okay. You can still invest in relationship. It makes a huge difference. We don't realize the importance of that personal element. I've had the privilege and great responsibility to do a fair bit of consulting over the past few years. And so many young people that I've seen and have shared with me, even personal friends of mine, who have explained the struggles that they have experienced in their relationship with the Lord. There's insecurities, feelings of unworthiness. Some of them do stay with the Lord, others turn away into human relationships because we're created for a relationship. And if children aren't finding it in the home or with the Lord, they're going to go try to find it somewhere else. And as I consider these youth, I wonder why. Because they had a wonderful background. They had a Christian family. Why these struggles? But in talking with the parents and learning the background, I find a story that's all too common. And that the parents were very careful to make sure they gave good instruction. They made sure there was exposure to spiritual things. They made sure there were good influences. They made sure the curriculum was good. The children learned to behave. They did well academically. They play a musical instrument. You know the list. But though they seem okay on the outside, they're struggling at a deep and often unconscious level. And what I found is that they are longing for a relationship with the Lord, but they don't know how to form it because they never experienced it. Their parents didn't take that time to talk, to walk, all day, every day, investing in relationship. They viewed education purely as informational. They didn't bind the hearts of their children to theirs. And these young people want a relationship with the Lord, but they can't figure out how to form it when they never experienced it. Again, I'm not saying it's impossible later on if you haven't experienced it during childhood. Praise the Lord. But it sure makes it easier. And it sure avoids a lot of challenges. Let's just make this simple and practical. Parents, are you wanting to increase the impact of the instruction you give your children? Yes or no? Okay. Spend time with them. Do you want them to stay close to the Lord when they grow up? Then keep them close to you while they're little. little. You know, does it ever strike you as strange that we encourage our toddlers to be independent and wonder why they won't talk to us when they're teenagers? Keep them close while they're little. Do you want them to have a solid relationship with you, with the Lord, as teenagers? That starts long before they reach the teenage stage. The point is this. Don't depend on your church or the Bible lessons or the perfect curriculum. There isn't one. Or on family worship to impart a knowledge of God. You need to be the example and spend time with your children. Allow them to experience it with you. Does that require sacrifice? Self-sacrifice. Absolutely. 
because it's much easier just to convey information. It's much easier just to teach about God than to exemplify his character to your children. <clears throat> Developing relationship means not sending them out to play while you do the housework. Go play with them. You say, how am I going to get the housework done? They're going to do it with you. You say, that's going to take forever. You're absolutely right. That's going to make a mess. You're absolutely right. Fun. <laughs> Fun mess. <laughs> but you're investing in relationship. That little one is helping you wash the dishes, even though they're actually making a disaster and taking five times longer. You're investing in relationship. When you're making a meal together and the food comes out terrible, it's okay. You're investing in relationship. True education can get messy. <laughs> But all the occupations of everyday life, parents learn to look at it this way. All the occupations, everything that happens throughout the day is another opportunity for you to find an entrance to your child's heart and a teachable moment. Deuteronomy method means living life together. Because remember what the Bible says. In Judges 2.10, that that second generation did not know the Lord. That Did you catch that word? And I talked yesterday, our modern understanding of the word know means to have information, but not in the Bible. Know means to have a relationship with. So what is the Bible saying? That second generation, there was no relationship. They have a connection. Let me put it just like this. Spending time with your child is education. Mm -hmm. Either good or bad. And it's up to, you, up to you to make it as positive as possible. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Parents, represent that to your children. Spending time with your child is showing them the character of a God who says, I'm with you. Spending time with your child, listening to them talk, and tell you a story for the 50,000th time is showing them the character of a God who says, my ear is always open to your prayer. Taking time when you're busy to spend with your child, showing them that they are the priority in demonstrating the character of a God who put the universe on hold to come and be one of us. And I want to emphasize this begins in infancy. Don't wait until they're four or five. Start early. Hold your babies. Carry them. Snuggle them. Show them affection. Talk more about that in another talk. Let me just give an example from a personal story. I was doing a seminar a while ago, and um, there was a mother there who you knows she's experienced some challenges with her voice and we we went on a walk and there was obvious disconnect just say i don't want to give too many details but um <clears throat> we uh we were preparing to eat lunch uh, in the afternoon and this mother was, uh, the, well, the boys went off to play in the creek, as boys are wont to do. And uh, this mother was busy visiting with her friend, preparing the food. And every once in a while, she just yell at them, and, oh, stop, you know, don't do that, or come here, or you know, something like that. And um, it, it was a challenge for her. And yet I recognized, as I was sharing on some of this material, that she really saw her need of, of establishing a connection. And, it was interesting because there was another mother there who had two boys, I believe age nine and 13, if I remember right. And throughout the sermon, uh, the little boys were sitting with her. The nine-year-old had his head on, his, on her lap throughout the sermon. And after lunch, 
they also went to play in the creek. Guess where mom was? Playing in the creek with them. <laughs> we were taking a walk that afternoon. They were just with her. She was with them. They're all happy, great relationship. Whatever they, she asked them to do, you know, they were happy to obey. And we came to a point where we were going to cross the road. And he got to the edge of the road. She took them by the hand, big boys that they were. And they took off across the road together, laughing all the way. Best of friends. And someone in the group commented. They said, wow, that mother is lucky that her boys still want to be with her. I was struggling not to do that when, <laughs> when he said that. I'm like, lucky? What are you talking about? That's not luck. I was invested in relationship, in time, probably when she didn't want to. Do you think she really wanted to go throw rocks in the creek? Probably not. But she recognized it would mean a lot to them. And you know what's really interesting? Later on that day, they wanted to go do something, and she said, no, I need you to stay with me right now. They were happy to comply because they knew that she had their best interest. And they knew that when she was available, she would go and be with them. And I think about the verse in the Bible that says that we love him because he first loved us. Jesus didn't say, come here and be with me, straighten up. He said, I'll go and be with you. I'll demonstrate the character of God. To you. I'll become one of you. I'll demonstrate self-sacrifice so you can see it played out in real life. And as love is awakened in your heart, come and follow me. As love awakens love. We want our children to be interested in what we're interested in. We're going to need to first be interested in what they're interested in. Moms? Go throw some rocks with your boys. Go look at those bugs and snakes. <laughs> I know it's hard. <laughs> now let me turn this one on the dads. Dads, go cook with your little girls. <laughs> Invest in relationships. Demonstrate the character of Jesus. It takes self-sacrifice. But taking your minds back to the children of Israel, you know what said that Jerusalem was destroyed because the education of her children was neglected. That's exactly what happened there. With the children of Israel, they failed to invest in relationship. They passed it on to the next generation. And it started a period of up and down and up and down and up and down throughout the history of Israel. And eventually, the nation was destroyed. I don't want that to be about us. It's going to take relationship to raise the second generation. I don't think we want any of that second generation to be missing in the kingdom of God. So though it takes self-sacrifice, I want to appeal to you. Make the time. Spend the time. Invest in that relationship. I also realize some of you may be thinking, thinking, well, I've totally failed. I have not understood this. I have not invested in relationship. My children are older. What can I do? Book Education says that the Christian will treat every mistake as a stepping stone to better and higher things. Mistakes are not failures. Mistakes are opportunities to improve and do better the next time. And I can tell you, it is never too late to invest in relationship. I wish we had time. I'd tell you stories. But it is never too late, no matter the age, to invest in relationship. Your children may be children. They may be teenagers. They may be grown adults. Invest some time with them. Ask them questions. Find out about them. Find out about their lives, what they like doing. Do things with them. And you'll see a transformation of character you never thought was possible. But of course, it starts with what? These words 
shall be in thine arms. So you need to be studying and asking the Lord for transformation of character yourself. Amen. All right. I think it's lunchtime. That's what my stomach tells me anyway. Uh, the schedule agrees. So we're going to take a break for lunch. We'll come back at two o'clock. Uh, James is going to have a message for fathers, especially. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, any announcements?